Hey guys, how's it going? All right, so I'm going to get started here. So thanks for thanks for joining in. So um, my name is Caleb Lyles. Um, I'm a resident at Kettering Health, um, and um, today we're going to be talking about acute angle closure glaucoma. So a little bit about me. Um, I am a fourth year resident at uh, Kettering Health in ophthalmology. Um, for my undergraduate degree, I did biomedical engineering and I went to Wright State for that. Um, so I'm fourth year and I um, got connected to uh, Motivate MD as a way to um, be an advisor for um, pre-medical students and medical students and how to um, get into ophthalmology and sort of uh, spread the spread the word about uh, the field. So enough about me. Um, so for those who have done this before, um, this is sort of the outline of the um, presentation here. So we'll first go over the case, um, then we will um, go over the um, physical exam, the differential diagnosis, assessment and plan, and then give um, sort of a lesson on the physiology and pathology of the, the disease. So um, so your, your guys' job is to um, just ask questions. Um, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, and then here is the uh, SOAP um, and quiz link um, if you guys want to um, take a snapshot of that. All right, so quick poll here. Let me see if I can get to it. Okay, so... <clears throat> First question, what is your background? And, um, and then second question is how many days or weeks were spent on ophthalmology in medical school? For a lot of us, it was very minimal. Um, third one is what's your favorite TV show? And then number four is what is your favorite cuisine? Always interested to know what, what people are. Uh, like for their food. Nice to meet you, Caleb. Yeah, nice <laughs> to meet you. How are you doing? Good, good. Uh, uh, wh where are you from? I'm actually from Flor. I was born in Florida, and I was moved to Austin, Texas. So I moved here to Houston. So yeah. Okay, good deal. What are you a pre med? Are you a med school? Yes, pre med. Okay, good deal. Um, have you um, where did you find out about ophthalmology, or is this your first sort of experience? I'm a pre med student, so I've attended a lot of Motivate MD sessions before. So this is my first time meeting with you. Awesome. Good deal. Mm -hmm. Happy to have you. Thank you. Good deal. All right. So we got we got a lot of pretty med students here. So um, let me uh, see uh, what we got for the results. So all pre meds. So obviously you wouldn't have any exposure um, to ophthalmology. Let's see. Um, Oh man. Um, well, um, I'd have to log into that. So unfortunately, um, anyone willing to share their favorite TV show or cuisine? Hi, my favorite TV show is Prison Break. Nice. And love for it. cuisine, I had put sushi. Oh, love it. 
those are two of, of my favorites by far. That's awesome. I actually just had sushi last night. So. Good pick. So someone said criminal minds in Japanese. I mean, yeah, can't be either of those either. Those are some good answers. All right, so let's let's get on to the meat of the presentation here. Um, so just a second here. All right, so um, make sure that you have your soap note in front of you. Um, you would have scanned that in a in a prior slide there. I'll I'll try to go a little bit slower so you can write some things down, but. So um, basically, you're, you're going to come on call with me um, for a, an ER call. So at, at Kettering, we take call from home. So, um, so our pager goes off, and then we, we call the, um, the number on our pager, and um, we, we get the ER doc um, who's seeing this patient initially. So the case is a 78 year old female with a history of coronary artery disease and COPD um, presents with pain and redness in her right eye. Uh, she reports progressive pain and redness that began this morning. Um, she uh, complains of associated blurry vision and halos in the right eye. Uh, she den denies any symptoms in her other eye and her left eye um, she says her vision is fine in the left eye. Uh, when she got to the ER, um, she began to be nauseous and began vomiting um, a few times when she, when she got there. Um, so she denies any trauma um, preceding um, this event, um, and she doesn't wear any contacts. Um, she does wear glasses. Um, her ocular history is positive for severe cataracts bilaterally. Otherwise, um, her, um, her history is unremarkable. All right, so um, does anyone have um, a, a list or possibilities um, we, we call it a differential for someone that comes in with eye pain or headache and um, blurry vision. Does anyone have any ideas? Can be trauma related, could be not. See, let me check the chat here. Okay, yeah, exactly. Um, good job, Haley. So uh, migraines can definitely um, present with um, headaches and vision loss. So that's good. Um, exposure to lots of UV lights. Yep, absolutely. Um, so something really in the cornea um, that we are um, thinking of. Definitely have seen that on call. So, so that's a good one, Anna. Um, I'll wait just, just a few more seconds here to see if there's any, um, other, there are any other thoughts. Those are good, good thoughts. Okay. So I'll move on. Um, so corneal abrasion and ulcer, um, anytime we think about, um, things on the cornea, um, they can they can blur the vision and they can cause pain. So anything uh, related to either trauma or infection of the cornea is definitely going to cause a lot of pain and likely cause issues with the vision as well. Um, also, if the eye becomes inflamed or has blood um, in the front 
um, chamber of the eye. It's called a hyphema. Um, that can definitely um, produce uh, painful vision loss. Scleritis, so um, inflammation of the eye wall and um, the eye will get really red. Um, that can cause both pain and vision loss. Acute angle closure glaucoma, which is obviously the title of this talk, which we'll get into more. Temporal arteritis, that's a, that's a big one in ophthalmology that um, we, can't, we can't miss. Um, it's more rare, but it definitely can cause um, permanent vision loss um, if, if we don't catch it early enough. Migraine, um, like Haley mentioned as well, can do it. So questions to consider in our case, um, we ask um, the ED doctor if um, he asked the patient if the pain is sharp or throbbing, um, is there a location behind the eye? Do they have a headache versus eye pain? Um, is there pain on the side of their head in a temporal location? Um, we ask about other visual complaints or history of migraines um, that would help clue us into a migraine. Ocular vital signs. So there are three ocular vital signs that we um, look for when we're on call. Um, so a vision, uh, meaning visual acuity, um, we, we, you know, typically it takes the form of, you know, 2020, are they 2060, which is worse? Can they only count fingers in front of them? And then uh, we look for reactivity of the pupils. And then uh, we ask that the ED docs measure the pressure inside the eye. So let's see. Okay. So um, the physical exam that the ED doc gives us is that the visual acuity is in the right eye, so OD means the right eye. It's a, it's a Latin abbreviation. So the right eye vision is count fingers at two feet. So definitely um, pretty, pretty um, blurry on, in that eye. In the left eye, it's, it's a little bit blurry, but not, not near as blurry as the right eye. Uh, the intraocular pressure is 62 millimeters of mer mercury. Um, so that's very, very high. Um, in the left eye, it's in a normal range. Um, so normal intraocular pressure is 10 to 21. That would be important to note. Um, so the pupils, um, the pupil exam, um, when you shine a light in the right pupil, it's uh, non-reactive. Um, in the le left eye, it's perfectly reactive. So when I hear this uh, story, um, over the, um, while I'm on call, you hear all these things, I, I'm set for a, a long night of trying to get this patient's uh, pressure down. So I'm definitely going in for this one. Um, and it will require likely multiple hours of trying to get their pressure down different through different means. So this is what I see on call. Um, so uh, this uh, image on the left is, is using a slit lamp. Um, we use microscopes in ophthalmology um, to see the fine, fine structures in the front of the eye. So um, in image one here, um, you see that the, the, um, the angle between the cornea and the iris is very narrow. There's supposed to be a, a nice space here um, that will allow fluid to exit the eye. Um, in image two, um, we're also seeing that the eye is obviously very red. We call that injected. And that, that the details of the iris or this colored part of the eye are pretty hazy. Um, the cornea is pretty cloudy as well. Um, and the 
pupil is in a mid dilated position. Um, in image number three, um, in ophthalmology, we also get to use um, really cool lenses and lights to look at the back of the eye and look at the vessels and look at the optic nerve and the center of the vision called the macula. So in this, we see that the optic nerve is swollen. So that um, clues us in that the optic nerve is being stressed in some way. So this physical exam um, documentation here just um, puts out in writing what we are seeing. So the cornea is hazy and edematous, which is swollen throughout. Um, the anterior chamber, which is the front chamber of the eye, is shallow. Um, down here, um, we can see that the lens, which is sits behind the iris, it helps focus light onto the retina. It's become very dense um, and it's hard to see through. So that's that's been there a long time and that, that can contribute to what's going on as well. The optic nerve has mild diffuse edematous margins like we were seeing in the previous picture. Um, in, the, in the left eye, um, we swing the microscope over and we see a relatively normal exam. Um, the patient has a somewhat shallow anterior chamber um, as well in the left eye. So at this point, um, we are looking at likely um, that we have an acute primary angle closure glaucoma. So what that means um, in the vast majority of cases is that there is a large cataract that is pushing the iris forward and closing off the angle. Um, there are other considerations, but um, especially since we have an elderly patient um, who has a large cataract um, and has developed angle closure, that's the leading differential. Um, of note, um, this, this would be important to um, write down as well. Um, medications that are used um, for migraines like topiramate or topamax um, can cause bilateral angle closure, which is it's a very unique thing that happens um, that can cause the pressure in both eyes to be significantly elevated. So um, after that, um, I, I go out and, and write my note. Okay, let, let me look in the chat real quick. Let's see. Okay, um, so let me go back here. Um, Luther um, got, okay. So, sorry about that. So, um, so in terms of um, causes of secondary angle closure, so um, you can get bilateral angle closure from from medications, which is a relatively unique uh, finding um, that we see that can cause um, pressure in both eyes to be significantly elevated. Um, patients taking uh, topamax or topiramate um, is, is the classic sort of thing that I've seen on while on call that has caused this. Um, even in uh, younger patients, um, they, they can get this as well. So that's something else to consider if, if the pressure in both eyes is high. So um, I walk out, out of the room and, and go to my computer and um, do all my documenting. Um, so we have angle closure glaucoma in the right eye. We have blurry vision secondary to angle closure. And then we have right eye pain, which is kind of, kind of a general um, assessment. So um, what I would do at this point is begin an IV medication um, called Diamox. It's also known as acetazolamide. As long as the patient's kidney function is okay, 
um, and they don't have any allergies to the medication. Um, I would probably I would also uh, start them on frequent drops. Um, one of them is a combination drop, um, Cosopt. It's a uh, combination of uh, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and a beta blocker. Um, and I would also start bromonidine, which is an alpha two uh, agonist. And I would I would have the nurses try to put that in every fifteen minutes. I would probably put them in myself because a lot of uh, ER nurses are just way too busy for that kind of thing. So I'd I'd probably be at the bedside um, doing this um, myself. Um, so um, if um, in medicine, a lot of times we use um, if then statements. So, so the pressure in this case was 62 um, when we initially, it was initially checked. Um, so I, I would probably wait a couple hours um, for, for this Dimox and Cosopt and Bromonidine to kick in. Um, if the pressure was not below about 30, um, I might um, give another round of that IV Diamox or um, give another medication called Manitol. Um, so in, in this case, after three hours and two rounds of IV Diamox, um, the IOP still hasn't, the intraocular pressure, sorry, um, has not come down much. It's only come down seven points. So uh, there is a, a quick procedure that you can do at the bedside um, if um, hasn't the pressure in the eye has not come down with medications. Um, it's basically basically it's um, taking a very very small uh, needle and basically going in through the side of the cornea and kind of uh, poking a hole through the through the cornea to let some of the fluid out. Um, so um, this is definitely not for the, the queasy and, um, that are joining us here. But um, anyways, um, that gives us a good uh, pressure reduction to um, a normal range. So um, at that point, um, I would send the patient home on the, the two different drops um, to take. Um, and I would, would schedule them for a laser um, in cataract surgery. Um, since, since the eye has the same anatomy, um, typically in the other eye, I would also do um, what we call a prophylactic uh, laser in the, in the left eye. And we'll talk about um, what all this means here in the next slide. Okay, so this anterior chamber paracentesis. So that, that means that we're taking a needle, putting it through the cornea and to the front of the eye. So we do that real quick, um, and then we come on out, and that, that just lets some of the fluid in the eye out um, to relieve the pressure. Um, this um, laser procedure that we talked about is called a peripheral iridotomy. Um, this allows the pressure in the eye to um, be uh, relieved by creating a hole in the iris. And we'll kind of talk about why that works. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, the physiology of how uh, the fluid in the eye is produced and what, what happens um, uh, when the angle of the eye becomes closed or, or the outflow tract becomes closed. So pressure or so fluid, sorry, is produced in the ciliary body, which sits behind the iris. Um, it is, it travels around uh, the lens here and around the iris through this little space into the front of the eye. This is the the anterior chamber, and it flows out here um, through um, the trabecular meshwork, 
um, through the, uh, what we call this angle here. This angle is supposed to be nice and wide open. So, so that fluid can flow out. What happens in angle closure glaucoma is that fluid is produced um, in the ciliary body. And um, this little narrow passageway um, has become blocked um, for whatever reason. Most of the time that is um, from a large cataract and we call this pupillary block. So when, when pupillary block happens, um, fluid cannot pass around the, the lens and it starts pushing this iris or the colored part of the eye close to the cornea. So when that happens, um, this angle or the outflow tract of the eye um, becomes closed and basically the um, a stopper is put in the sink and um, fluid builds up in the sink or the eye. Um, the eye becomes, uh, the pressure inside of the eye uh, builds up and it puts lots of pressure on the optic nerve. So um, the optic nerve can only withstand a certain pressure um, just like any other uh, nervous tissue in the body. And um, this is kind of a time dependent uh, process that happens. So we, we wanna relieve this pressure as, as quickly as we can to, in order to preserve as much as possible of the optic nerve. So that's the treatment strategy and um, acute angle closure is to reduce the pressure by, by whatever means we can. So acute angle closure is a time and uh, pressure or intraocular pressure, that's what IOP stands for, um, sensitive ocular emergency. Um, a higher uh, pressure, um, in our case it was 62, um, right? and duration of attack um, leads to more complications and visual field loss. So visual field loss is the result of optic nerve damage. Um, and um, yeah, we, we talked we talk that it was a time sensitive um, ocular emergency. So uh, the longer the patient sits with this very high pressure, the more that they're going to lose, um, you know, part of their visual field from this. Um, so complications that can arise, especially if untreated, um, the um, the fellow eye or the contralateral eye um, has a very high percentage of developing the same. So um, this is why we um, consider treating the, um, the contralateral eye. Um, another complication is corneal decompensation, but um, so the, the initial swelling that happens in the cornea is typically a reversible process. When, once the pressure in the eye um, resolves, then the cornea typically uh, clears uh, on its own. Um, another complication that we were talking about, permanent visual field loss from optic nerve damage. And we will show an example of how that, um, how that will look to the patient. Um, chronic angle closure glaucoma, especially if it's untreated, so that that, um, that outflow tract of the eye can become permanently closed. Um, ischemic optic neuropathy, retinal vein occlusion, um, both of those can also happen as well. So in acute angle closure, what you typically see is uh, decreased visual acuity from a patient's uh, baseline, uh, what they typically see day to day. Uh, the pressure is typically in the 40 to 80 range. Uh, that's something important to note. Um, the pupil will not react. Um, that's something also important to note. Um, the iris does not work properly. Um, it, it cannot, um, the muscles don't, don't function excuse me, well, if the pressure is that high 
um, corneal edema is something that you definitely see in angle closure. Um, the anterior chamber that we were talking about is typically shallow and that, that angle is narrow. Um, a lot of times in these patients, we'll see large cataracts, um, typically in an elderly patient. Um, if we do get a view to the optic nerve, um, we, we can sometimes see that the optic nerve is, is swollen, but um, a lot of times we can't see to the back of the eye because the cornea is too swollen to see through it. Um, so um, part of our evaluation after we have treated the acute issue is to monitor for the damage that has taken place. So um, we use a sort of, it's kind of like an ultrasound. It's called an OCT. Um, and we, we look at the um, thickness of the optic nerve and look, look for any damage that's taken place. So that's kind of a structural, um, a structural way of assessing the optic nerve. And a functional way of looking at the optic nerve um, is to look at a, a patient's visual field. So that's a subjective test. Um, and they, they click buttons when they see the lights and that can, that can help um, show us um, the damage that's taken place. So treatment, we kind of went through these um, when we treated our patient. But um, IOP lowering drops, so pressure lowering drops, the, that was Cosopt and Bermodidine in our case. Uh, IV Diamox, typically I, uh, I'll start patients on this even before I get to the emergency room. Um, that little procedure I was talking about to the cornea. Um, the, the laser procedure is also something that you can do to lower the pressure. And um, so th that, that's sort of a temporizing measure. It's a temp temporary fix for the issue. But it's especially if they have a large mature cataract, um, you want to remove the cataract. Uh, we also think about the other eye and its risk of angle closure. So we um, typically will do a preventative um, laser in the other eye. So here are a few examples of what we are looking at um, once we get back to evaluate the patient in um, the outpatient setting in the clinic. Um, so here is the optic nerve here. And um, th these fibers will kind of course around here. And we, we can tell damage or thinning um, to the optic nerve by, um, by just um, this sort of ultrasound. Um, you'll, you'll see um, different red areas and um, that'll clue you into what part of the optic nerve has been damaged. So the functional um, assessment of this optic nerve is through a visual field. So a normal visual field is shown here. Um, glaucoma can um, um, affect uh, first the peripheral vision and then it starts to affect the central vision as the damage becomes more severe. So if if we left our patient untreated, um, you know they they could they could progress. Um, you know, they, if they were left like that um, for you know days to weeks, you know they could progress through this very rapidly. So here are my sources here. Does anyone have any questions? Please ask questions if you have any. Yeah, I have a question. Can you go over the VF functional that you were just showing us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, in a normal visual field, um, so this would be of the right eye, um, in a normal visual field, uh, there is a normal blind spot um, in the eye, which um, represents the optic nerve. 
So the optic nerve doesn't have any um, ability to uh, sense. Um, it doesn't have any um, nerve fibers that are sensing anything. That's that's the origin of, of all of the um, retinal nerve fibers. Okay, so so this is um, the uh, blind spot, um, and then um, so. So this is representing what the patient is seeing. So over time, um, these, um, these fibers that are um, affecting more of the peripheral vision will be uh, affected and the patient will have uh, constriction of their visual field. Um, it, it depends on um, how quickly that, that we've caught this, but um, it, it can cause pretty severe uh, restriction over time if it's not if it's not caught. Um, so this is just a, a representation of, of what the patient's seeing. Um, how the test works is is um, the patients basically put in a fishbowl and they um, they're shown a series of lights and um, they will click the button every time they they see the light and um, if the if the test senses that they can't see something that they're supposed to see then it will shade it in a darker color so this is the black or the gray represents the part that they can't see so this just shows the progression um, of glaucoma over time is that does that uh, answer your question is that sufficient Yes, thank you. Yeah, awesome. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Anna. Um, I have a quick silly question because of yeah. the from the pressure. What causes the, the pressure, the fluid inside of the eyeball or inside yeah. the anterior? Absolutely. Yeah, so great question. So um so what happens is um so so we talked about a little bit the um the ciliary body produces the fluid inside the eye. And that is supposed to travel around the um, around the lens and through the iris and into this front part of the eye, and it's supposed to exit um, just um, just as a drain uh, through this uh, angle of the eye. So what happens is an angle closure is that. Um, that there's a blockage of um, this fluid um, through this little um, pathway between the lens or, or the cataract in this case and the iris. So the fluid is all trapped here. So this this not only becomes a problem because uh, fluids you know um, force back here, but um, it forces the iris, because there's so much fluid here, to move forward, and um, that closes off that outflow tract. So there's no way for fluid to exit the eye, and, and that can become a problem very, very quickly. Um, fluid is not allowed to escape the eye, just like a, a clogged drain, um, and you'll get... Um, an overflowing sink in, in that case, but except, you know, the, the, the sink won't be allowed to overflow. It, it will just create a pressure inside a, inside a, a contained environment. Is that, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, much clearer now. Awesome. Great question. Um, silly question. Um, the fluid that's in your eye, mm -hmm. would that's like the well, it's known that when you wake up, the crust that's in your eye is that that fluid is, is that that fluid that comes out that drains? 
No, so, so, so good question. So um, that's a different type of fluid. So um, a lot, lots of times patients can get, um, you know, either crustiness around their eyes from, um, from just fluid that has been sitting there. Um, it's almost like tears and it's uh, the stagnant tears overnight that, that can kind of develop into a crust and all, all this kind of nastiness. Um, but, but that fluid um, basically comes from our tears and um, there are a few other contributors to the secretions and the sort of um, um, tear film of the eye that are more, um, that are more like fat soluble kind of components. But so that comes from the lacrimal gland and the um, other um, fluid producing compartments and the outside eye. So there is, um, there is a system of uh, fluid within the eye that maintains uh, the shape of the eye um, and maintains the normal structures um, that the eye is supposed to function in. So, so the, the eye actually, if you press on your eye, you know, on the outside of it, it has some resistance to it. And um, there is a normal range at which that is supposed to be. And that is created because, um, because the ciliary body is producing fluid and it's allowed to drain at um, sort of an equilibrium, um, you could say. And um, th th that's what um, pressurizes our eye and, and gives it a normal sort of springing. So, so all that's contained within that sort of closed, um, semi-closed system in a way. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I, I think there are a few other uh, things to go over. Um, so we have some future vir virtual shadowing topics, uh, acute cholelithiasis, breast cancer, endocarditis, and harm reduction and substance abuse uh, treatment. And again, here's the um, here's the um, QR code for the SOAP and quiz link to to take um, after this. Um, so what's next? Um, you just fill out the ten question quiz to the best of your ability. Um, if you score above eighty percent, you'll get a certificate of completion. I'm sure um, most of you are aware of. Uh, doing this before, and then check out the folder for additional resources. All right, and let's see. Have someone in the chat. Okay, all right. You're welcome, Anna. Um, so uh, th thanks everyone for joining. Um, so um, feel free to to message me personally um, or reach out to um, the. Motivate MD staff. If you have any questions for me, I'm I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that you guys have. So, all right, you guys have a good night. Thanks. So, Caitlin, that was a very excellent presentation, and I really enjoyed it. Oh, so, okay. yeah, of course. So, can you actually tell me what is your day in the life like? as a medicine in the, in the ophthal ophthalmology yeah, division. Absolutely. Um, let me try to, sorry, let me see if I can turn on my... Yeah, 
let me stop screen sharing. Switch back over. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so um, it, being an ophthalmology resident, um, it's great. It's um, it's one of the, the easier specialties. Uh, well, it's it's one of the uh, nicer specialties in terms of time um, to, that is um, committed to um, you know day to day stuff. So um, my my day in the life. Um, um, so let's go through a Monday. So. I would be um, seeing patients um, in a residency clinic on, on Monday, usually from about eight to five. Um, I, would, I would be seeing um, routine follow-ups, glaucoma patients, um, um, cataract evaluations, um, any, any sort of chronic problem that a patient would have um, that would be scheduled, I would see those patients. Um, others, other patients that I would see would be um, ER follow-ups. Um, so patients that were in the ER last night or you know last week or something. Um, and um, so that's usually an eight to five kind of thing on a Monday. On Tuesday, I would do the same thing. Um, I would see patients from eight to noon, maybe, and then um, walk over to our um, operating room. And um, at, at this point in residency, I, I would be doing, um, you know, pretty much all of the cataract surgeries. Um, cataract surgery is. Um, Pretty much the bread and butter of, of ophthalmology. Um, that's what we devote most most of our time to um, because that's what a comprehensive ophthalmology just does. Um, do, do you want me to talk about cataract surgery or anything is fine. Yeah, anything. Yeah. So cataract surgery. Um, so the, the lens of the eye it sits behind the, the iris, and it becomes. Uh, hard, cloudy over time, causes blurry vision. So um, what we do in cataract surgery is we make a few little incisions in the, in the side of the cornea. And um, we go in, um, you know, we fill the eye up with the jelly material. And um, in order to get to the substance of the cataract, we have to, um, we have to peel a little um, circle out, out of the middle. So um, once we peel a circle um, out of the middle of the uh, of the lens, then we can go in with with some instruments that kind of use um, some ultrasonic energy to break up the cataract. Um, and all this is done sort of under a microscope. So we're we're, we're looking straight ahead, and we have our hands. Kind of on the patient, and we have our instruments in our hands, so everything's very delicate. Um, mm -hmm. So, so we we use that um, those instruments to break up the cataract. We we do it mechanically, and in order to um, put the ultrasound sound energy into the eye, we um, use foot pedals as well. So we're using all all four extremities to do this. Um, so we, we break up the cataract and uh, sort of aspirate out the contents. And then we put in an artificial lens in the eye that is unique to that patient's eye. Um, it's plastic. It stays with them for life. Um, and then the patient goes home the same day. And um, we see him in the morning. So, oh, nice. so that, that, that surgery for patients um, is very life changing for sure. Um, patients can s sometimes only see movement from their hand, from someone's hand. Um, and after they can, you know, maybe like a month after they can be seeing 2020. So it's, it's super life changing for, for patients. And patients are really appreciative um, of what we do. Um, that's one of 
the biggest rewards we get in the field. So, um, so, th so that's great. Um, so there might be three, um, three of those cases on a, on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, then Wednesday would probably be the same. Um, Thursday, um, Thursday, we usually don't have clinic to be honest. And then um, mm -hmm. Friday, we would uh, have the same as Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, at this point, I only have to take what's called backup call. So what's backup call? Yeah. So that's where um, the younger residents are taking primary call. So they're, they're the ones that get called first and they um, deal with most of the stuff and they would ask me if they have a question or if they have something surgical, like a surgical emergency um, that uh, needs to be taken care of, then I would go in and do that surgery. So um, that's what I do now. Um, before, we would probably take call for a week at a time, maybe once every four weeks. So, yeah. Nice, nice. Is it hard work as a resident doing this type of field? So, relatively speaking, it's um, as a resident, you are working a lot less hard than your other um, than residents around you, for sure. Um, it is hard work, for sure, but um, relatively speaking, compared to all the other fields, you're putting in a lot less hours um, and um, it's just a rewarding field for sure. Yeah. That's good, that's good. Any advice for pre-medical students like myself who are very interested in applying for ophthalmology that you would like to give? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, for myself, I, I went to an osteopathic school, DO school. Um, you know, some schools um, really um, look at um, auditioners or, or um, students that um, will come and sort of do a two, two week long interview. Um, those can be very important um, to programs. Um, for programs that value those auditions, um, it's it's really important to um, to show your personality, um, be yourself, um, because a, a lot of times the, the residents will have a say and and who gets um, who gets an interview and who they take eventually. So th those auditions can become important for certain for certain uh, programs. Um, it's it's definitely harder now that uh, step one is pass fail. Um, I would definitely take step two um, to try to sting distinguish yourself um, academically. Um, trying to think here. Um, Trying, trying to reach out to um, different either mentors or connections to ophthalmology to try to get letters of recommendation that can become extremely important. Um, so yeah, th those are probably the biggest pieces of advice I have. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Caleb, for an again. Thank you, Caleb, for an excellent presentation. Nice knowing you, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Me too. Wish you all the best and get some rest. You you're gonna I bet you're gonna have a very busy day tomorrow. Oh yeah. Yep. That I will. Yep. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Take care. Yeah, you too. All right. So, you know what? Um hello. Um, hey. Hey Luther. Sorry, I'll say a little I'll stay a little longer than listening to your conversation about the cataract surgery. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Also have another thing. Um uh so, I'm starting biomedical engineering next year. Are you? Um, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Any, I've always worried about that. It's brought me relief now since you got into medical school off biomedical engineering. I always thought that it was like an opposite of what I wanted to do. 
but um, is there anything I should worry about in, you know, the yeah. road? Yeah. Um, so um, what what got you into bi biomedical engineering and um, what um, like were you, were you just told about it for me medical school? Were you interested in it before? Um, well, thinking about applying. I kind of like, kind of did a program, um, just yeah. to in just like the program I joined into it. At first, it was just because like I wanted to do it just just to see what it's like, and then I actually liked and enjoyed it and how like the outcome of things were. We did like a little project, and I was like, oh, I really do enjoy it. So. Mm -hmm. And then that's why I fell in love with it. Yep. But it also it crossed my mind. I'm like, I also want to do be in the medical field. Yeah. So I'm so, like, yep. So that that was my dilemma as well. So I will explain um, how I got introduced into biomedical engineering and um, how it, I mean, it it was a great thing, but it was an extremely hard thing. I was I was sort of misled by the the by my advisors, but it it worked out in the end. Um, so basically, um, in biomedical engineering for me, um, I um kind of talked to to an advisor, and a few of my um buddies were doing biomedical engineering. And they were telling me that it would be a good idea to major in it um, because it would help me get into medical school. It would it would look really good on applications if I did biomedical engineering. So um, it it turned out going through it that I really really liked it actually. Um, I I kind of was was lucky in that sense because I I took um, the advice of my friends and advisor that it would help me get into medical school but turns out I really really liked it um that's definitely up my wheelhouse and um you know obviously ophthalmology um it's very technical and that's kind of why I picked ophthalmology but um so biomedical engineering is uh, um very very hard um in terms of um your, your GPA um, your GPA is something that medical schools will definitely look at, um, and that far, I think that really outweighs um, what th they how they would see your major, how they would see biomedical engineering. Um, so I would say that um, if you really are interested in biomedical engineering. Um, definitely go for it, um, but that can, um, you, you'll have to work extra hard to not let your GPA suffer. Um, you right. know, if, if you were to do something like biology and um, kind of skate by and get a 4.0, um, you know, maybe you wouldn't be as happy, but um you know, in, in terms of medical school, um, that would set you up be just better. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that's that's kind of how it worked. Um, I I ended up with with a still a good good GPA and biomedical engineering, but um, I felt like a lot of my biology um, friends that had. Um, a little bit better GPAs, um, they got better looks in medical schools. So I, 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 I felt like, um, you know, would, would I do it again differently? No, um, but just understand what you're getting into by um, choosing biomedical engineering and um, applying to medical school with that. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's sort of my experience. Um, I mean, bi biomedical engineering is great. Um, you know, even if, uh, medical school doesn't work out, um, personally, I had a fallback on biomedical engineering as a career. So, uh, I, I thought that was something I, I would like to do 
uh, long term if if medical school didn't work out. So, um, I you know I think it's a great field, um, but there are just some uh, a few oh, there. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you got it. Well, yeah, thank you so much for keeping it. You know, keep it real with me. Yeah, um, for sure. I think I've seen like the mathematics and I know that's just the beginning of it. Um, like the Einstein equation that, that really, it took me like a few days to learn that. Yeah. Yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, yeah, that's great. But, but thank you so much. Yeah, um, I would definitely sure. do this again. Most, and I'll probably most like a hundred percent email you with any other questions. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to take them. And, um, you know, um, it, it, you know, anytime my, my email is open and um, I